In this week's video, I'll be assembling a teapot from the components I threw in my previous video. And before I begin, Merry Christmas. The studio is still inundated with snow, and inside, even with the heating on full blast, as soon as I stop moving, it gets too cold to work. The building my workshop is situated in is an old industrial laundry, and it's anything but properly sealed, and I think most of the heat just dissipates and rises up through the cracks in the roof. And there's really only so many layers you can wear before it becomes practically impossible to make pots, as you simply can't move your arms easily enough. All the stoneware pieces I threw for these teapots are now the right condition to be assembled, and if anything I let the lids and body just get a touch too dry. But they should be fine, and I can just quickly dunk them in water to bring them back just a bit. On the other hand, the spouts are perfect. I placed a bucket over them overnight, and that pretty much stopped the drying in its tracks. Whereas with the bodies and the lids, I simply left them upturned like this. And I guess it must have been a bit more drafty in the studio overnight than I expected. Anyway, now that my components are all mostly leather hard, I can begin trimming them, joining them together, and finally pulling the handle that completes the pot. I always start with the lid, which I threw intentionally to be just a touch bigger than the opening of the jar. That way I can trim it back just enough so it slots in perfectly, so the piece is tap centred. After which three lumps of soft clay are secured around it, and as I do this I pin the lid down with my left hand. This way when I push the lump of clay firmly in place, it doesn't push the lid off centre. And so my first goal is to trim this vertical flange so that it fits the body of my teapot perfectly. In fact, I want there to be just the tiniest amount of wiggle room, as the lid shouldn't really feel like it's being pushed in place like a cork might, as during the firing, when both of these pieces are fired together, there is a chance the parts can move and warp slightly. And so you need to account for that by leaving just a millimetre or two, so there's just the smallest amount of movement. Once the locating flange has been trimmed to the correct size, I begin refining the internal form of the lid, removing some of that excess weight and making it just a touch more crisp. The lids of my pots are inherently quite heavy objects as there's so much clay on the underside as they have a thick rim and top. So to account for that, I try to remove as much clay as I can from the areas it's more accessible. I then burnish the sharper edges with my fingertips and trim this section so it just slopes inward ever so slightly, which tends to make it look a bit better when it sits up proudly on the teapot. With the lid done, it can be removed and I do one final check with the teapot before I move on to turning the body. And as you can see, when I place the lid in and rock it from side to side, there's just a tiny amount of movement. To attach the body of the teapot to the wheel, I brush some slip around the edge of the base. Not too much, and never directly in the middle, as that can make removing it later on quite difficult. I then place the teapot body on the wheel and begin tap centering it by rhythmically tapping it in one particular spot until it sits centrally, and usually by this time the slip underneath is dried in combination with the friction. And lastly I just squash a tiny portion of the wall into the wheel head, just to seal it in place. Leaving these uncovered to dry overnight meant that one side dried more than the other, which causes the pot to lean over in that direction, hence the undulation in the rim of this pot. To rectify this, I hold my turning tool very steadily, and I try to only remove clay from the high point as it spins around and I'll know when it's more or less level when the tool consistently makes contact with the rim of the teapot as I trim away the excess. And now when I hold my finger there, it stays stationary while certain parts of the rest of the pot still undulate. But generally, it's the rim I care about the most as it's that part which will have the greatest effect on how I'm able to trim the rest of this pot. I can even do the same thing to this ledge underneath, although of course any wobble you see at this point is really exaggerated by how quickly the piece is spinning in place. And as soon as the wheel stops and the pot is stationary, you simply can't see it. As for the trimming of the walls of this pot, it's all relatively straightforward. My tungsten carbide turning tools, made by Phil Boberka, are run up and down the walls, removing thin layers of clay, refining the shape and making the whole pot lighter in terms of weight. And if you look carefully at this point, you can actually see that one side of the pot that spins around is lighter than the other, 
clay itself has a bit more of a bright tone and this is the side that dried out more overnight. And you can even hear it in the noise the tool makes as the blade trims through the clay. As for the lower half of this pot, I'll be trimming this section to be narrower so it comes to a finer point which visually raises the pot up and makes it feel more elegant and light. As I turn, I keep my left hand perched up on the pot. It's ready to catch the pot if it becomes dislodged, but before that even happens, it should be able to sense if it's wobbling irregularly, whilst my turning hand and the tool can focus on removing clay. I also push in and down with it slightly, just to help keep it in place. I can also reach inside to feel the thickness of the walls. That way I know how much clay there is left to trim away. To tidy up these trimmed surfaces, I scrape over them with the flat edge of a sharp metal kidney. I can even hold it in such a way where it sits parallel to the surface. And if it doesn't sit completely flush against whichever plane it's placed upon, I can simply push with that part of the kidney more to remove more clay from that specific region, thus making it perfectly straight. And the useful thing about having a lid that fits so well is that I can trim it in situ with just a simple spinner placed on top which I can easily push down through to pin the lid in place. I now trim away clay from the outer portion of the lid, angling it in such a way that it looks like it's reflecting the angle beneath it, the upper half of the teapot's body. Although I want to leave it with a slight overhang so that the lid casts a significant shadow over the form underneath it. With the spinner removed, I can begin trimming the top of the lid. And for this part of the pot, I trim a very slight concave surface. This way it should encourage the glaze that's applied onto it afterwards to pool nicely. And it also takes the edge off what would otherwise be just a very straight flat top. These tungsten carbide tools can leave quite a rough surface. So usually once used, I burnish over the same areas with the smooth metal of a sharp metal kidney. This pushes the exposed coarse particles of sand back into the clay body, creating a much more even surface, which is especially important on the very sharp lip these lids have. I then take a hole piercer and with the wheel spinning, I poke it right through the center of the lid. This hole allows air to be drawn through the teapot as it's used. As without one, as the lid fits so well, the tea poured out would sputter and glug. Clean up the exit wound, I simply flip the lid over, tap center it into place. And then I use a combination of a tiny turning tool and the smooth side of the metal hole piercer to clean it up and to make sure there aren't any tiny burrs lodged inside it. This is the easy part really. The difficult step is glazing it and keeping it free of glaze so that it doesn't get blocked during the firing. Once that's done, the lid can be removed and then I properly trim the rim and the ledge just beside it. This is a step I always do after turning the lid as I make it quite fine and delicate at this point, which means if I trimmed it and then placed the heavier lid on top of it and trim that, whilst pushing down to keep it pinned in place quite considerably, there's a real chance, especially if the clay is quite dry, that the gallery can crack. I then remove the pot with a sharp metal knife, which I only need to push under the vessel a little bit as I didn't put slip all the way over the base. The wheel head is then thoroughly cleaned and the lid placed back down and centered for the final time. I push the three lumps of securing clay around it and then, thanks to the lid fitting so well, I can just place the teapot body upside down onto the lid to trim it, which means that throughout this process, at different points, the lid acts like a chuck for the body and the body acts like a chuck for the lid. And this time I'm using a smaller spinner as it fits the base a bit better, leaving me with a bit more room to work with. I have a variety of sizes and I find myself using these way more than I ever imagined I would. There's a ball bearing in between the white and the black part, which means you can hold the black part and push down firmly through it and it remains stationary in your hand whilst the white part spins around with the pot. And with it I just feel like I can push down and apply more even pressure without my fingertips being influenced by the slightly undulating surface of the clay, but perhaps most importantly, if I have a long day of trimming ahead of me, it creates a barrier between my fingertips and the coarse stoneware clay, which, if that spins against my fingers all day long, can easily make them quite red and raw. This last bit of trimming on the base is just to refine the shape 
and removed the last bit of weight there was, and as I found the larger tools were chattering somewhat, I did one last pass with this very tiny blade before scraping the surface clean with my flat-edged kidney. For the base I remove a beveled edge around the outside, and then I turn flat the very bottom and trim away the wiring off marks that are left over from when the pot is thrown and removed from the wheel. I want this portion of the pot to be as neat and tidy as the rest of the vessel, and I want my maker's mark that's going to be pushed into the clay here to be easily visible, so I can't leave the bottom too rough, as I think it would distract from my mark, and it just isn't really my aesthetic. Once the bottom's finished, I stamp it, using one of my new porcelain maker's marks I carved relatively recently. It leaves a simple, clear impression, and with the pot stamped, I can move on to the next step, which is attaching the spout. I slide a wearboard over my wheelhead and gather the necessary tools, which includes a basin of water, a sponge on a stick, a teapot of course, a straight edge sharp metal kidney, and a small sharp paring knife. The spouts are then uncovered and the bottoms of these are still really quite soft and for a moment or two I just hold it roughly in place just so I have a rough idea of where to cut the spout. And as always when doing this, I'm leaving myself more material than I might necessarily need as it's better having too much to work with as compared to having too little and the spout looking too small for the size of teapot. I offer it up to the body and carve away excess clay around the spout until it sits on the teapot and protrudes at the right angle. The clay at the bottom of the spout is still soft enough to be pinched and easily distorted and by keeping it this soft it'll make attaching it to the teapot so much easier. And the most important rule you should follow when attaching spouts to teapots is that the tip of the spout should protrude to basically the same line as the top of the gallery of the teapot. If the tip of the spout is about halfway up on the teapot, well, then you can only fill the teapot halfway up before all the tea starts pouring out. I then use a soaked conical sponge on a stick to fettle the inside of the spout just to clean up the surface if it's in any way rough, and then I use my fingertip just to compress those coarse specks of sand back into the clay body. I then push it gently into place before scoring all the way around it lightly with a potter's needle. This leaves me with a very clear area into which the holes can be pierced. And I do this process entirely by eye, by first making a central column of holes in the middle and then piercing three more on the right and left. As I push the whole piercer in, I rotate it around in a circle. This way it slices as it goes through, as opposed to just being shoved through with brute force, which could possibly distort the walls if they're too thin or too soft. Once pierced, I scrape over the surface with a knife to remove most of the burrs Blow the holes clear, and then I use the tapered end of a needle tool to neaten up each hole. Using the same needle, I then scratch deeply all the way around the holes, creating a roughed up ring onto which the spout will eventually be placed. As I'm going to be attaching quite a soft bit of clay to one that's much firmer, I need to be quite careful about how I join them. So by creating all these scratches and then covering it all with slip, it should create an area that's really quite soft and accepting of anything new attached to it. To make this process even easier, I soak the spout in water for about five minutes and then I dab slip over the scored lines. I don't brush it as that could flatten the scored marks. Instead, I want the slip to fill them. I then hold the spout carefully by the tip and firmly push it onto the body. Opposite where I'm sitting is a mirror, and by looking in that I can make sure it's protruding nice and straightly whilst also looking at the holes inside the teapot to make sure the spout aligns with them. And now, as the end of the spout has been soaked, it's incredibly easy to blend into the body. I do a majority of the work with just my fingertip, smoothing in the soft clay to create a really seamless join 
Once all that fingertip work is finished, I'll take the sponge on a stick and I'll go over all those areas. But as you can see, this leaves a relatively coarse surface as the softer clay is eroded away, leaving only the coarse specks of sand. So lastly, for the spout, and like I've done for other areas of this teapot, I can press all the way around the spout using both the smooth side of a curved metal hole piercer and simply my fingertips. And now, there's only one major step left, and that's to create the pulled handle. So I fill up a basin of warm water and put my apron on. I then take a block of soft clay and begin pulling one end of it into a long, thin strap. I only need one handle blank, but like the spouts, I'll make three just so I can choose the best. I place them right on the edge of my wooden workbench and snip them off with my thumb, so they're all more or less the same shape and size. I then repeat the exact same process with the teapot as I did when attaching the spout. I mark an area opposite the spout and then score that area and roughen up the clay. I then daub some slip over it and then I grab one of the handle blanks and then clasp it very lightly before tapping one end so that some material is flared out. This simple step provides me with material that I'll easily be able to blend into the teapot body without having to steal clay from the length of the handle which could otherwise create a thin point and during the next step, when it's pulled even further, it's often these thin points near the join which can result in the whole handle being ripped away as it's pulled thinner and longer. But before that process begins, I first spend a moment or two blending the handle into the body so that it joins seamlessly. Now, please forgive my poor camera positioning for this next bit. I don't always get it right, but essentially, with one wet hand, I pinch at the length of clay and pull it down. And I also pull three distinct grooves into the handle's back, which helps thin it out and create regions the glaze will be able to pull nicely into later on. I then loop this length down and attach it back onto the body of the teapot. With one finger, I smooth the clay in flush, just like I did with the top of the handle and for the spout. And I can also use the sponge too, to clear away the bigger lumps of clay. And then all of that is softened with a wetted fingertip. I try to make my teapots so the spout and handle have a similar strength, and so they occupy roughly the same sort of area either side of the lid. And now, as the handle is still really soft, I'll let the teapot dry upside down for about 15 to 20 minutes. This way, the arc of the handle will dry in the right shape as if I place the teapot the right way up, the handle could sag slightly as it dries, losing its shape. I'll also use this moment just to burnish over the base one last time, as it's really common during the handling stage for the base of the teapot to be moved around quite a lot on the tabletop, and as it's still relatively soft, it can really easily be damaged, and the grain of the wood can impress itself into the clay. I then do the same thing for the lid, And that's the construction of the teapot finished. The spout and handle balance each other nicely, and the lid appears heavy, but it's actually quite light in the hand. In truth, it's been a while since I've made any teapots, mainly due to the fact that I actually haven't been in the studio as much as I normally am this year, due to another ongoing secret project, which I should be able to announce in February. But making this, even if it was just one teapot, felt wonderful, and it left me wanting to make many more. Lastly, I place the teapot back upside down, give it a light spray with some water, and then I wrap it up really tightly with plastic. I do this as because there are so many adjoined appendages when making teapots, the chances of cracks occurring between them is really quite high. So, to negate that as best I can, I let these dry out really, really slowly. And that's it for this week. I hope you will have the very best day and if you have decided to take a moment out of your Christmas to watch this, then thank you. It means the world to me. I hope you found it useful, or helpful, or just interesting. And I'll see you next week.